key in Daboya on the Google search button and salt mining pops up first, even though the town is also known for massive production of hand-woven smocks, salt mining was what caught my attention. So I set out to find out more about this valuable commodity in Daboya. Upon arrival, the existence of the salt deposits in the community was confirmed to me and was told about its medicinal values to them. So the quest to embark on my salt mining expedition began. I'm currently at Daboya in the Savannah region. Daboya is well noted for its salt mining activities that happened centuries ago. So I'm here to unravel the mysteries of this commercial commodity here in Daboya. I'm going salt mining. It was a bumpy, dusty road leading to the salt mining site. The bad roads here require a sturdy vehicle, but unfortunately, at the first time of my visit, I had to make do with a tricycle. So I hopped onto my hired tricycle, also known as Yellow Yellow Adaboya. The ride to the most talked about salt mining site was not enjoyable due to the bad road. The tricycle got stuck at a point, but giving up was not an option. In 20 minutes, the engine stopped and I was signaled that we had arrived at the salt mining site. It was just a vast land filled with sand on the right and a river on the left. This particular place is the Daboya salt mining area. I'm here to explore the natural resources here that nature has blessed Daboya with. But unfortunately, it is not visible to see salt. Here on the mining site, my expectation was to see mounts of salt deposits, or at least indigents on the site busily working, but the opposite was what my camera lenses captured. All that was inside here was cow dung with Fulani herdsmen feeding their cattle. Disappointed? Yes, I was, but I had hope hope to at least see this commodity to tell my story. After the hard and long search for the commodity, I was led to a portion of the land close to the river where it is believed salt was sighted. In my quest to explore more of the salt mining expedition of the people of Daboya, I am here and all I can see is samples of salt around stones. You wouldn't see a heap of salt gathered at a particular place. And I'm told you need to perform some rites and rituals before you would see the salt on the surface of the land. Still on the never-ending search for salt, I met an elder of the town who goes by the name Na Abudu Shaibu. To him, the Daboya salt was a gift given to them by a priestess due to the receptive nature of the Daboya people. A woman came to this community. We received her for two years. And when the woman was about to go, the woman said, we should give her a place, a vast land where she will also bless us because the way we took care of her, that is not what she got in other community. So we should show her a vast land where she can bless us. She asked the chief to sit down. Uh, she came with her prayers and incantation. So after that, uh, we saw salt on top of the Soil. I further asked Na Abudu why the salt deposit given to them was not visible. 
The reason why the soil is no more functioning here is uh, olden days, young ones used to sit with we the elders. But nowadays, because of school, everybody wants to send the child to school so they don't get closer to we the elders to know exactly what is happening based on the salt issue. <laughs> I was still not convinced by this response, so I journeyed back to the chief's palace and Benakwerua, Sumbori the first of Wasipi traditional area, gave an overview. <laughs> It belongs to the queen and those of her people who were living here before. So when it comes to mining it, she would have to gather her queen mothers, gather all the uh, traditional and cultural heads to go and mine it. Then we all have some in sacks that we can send to friends, we can eat and so on. Commercialization was in the past when there was a struggle for it. From his explanation, it was evident that salt was mined in large volumes in the days of old. It was used as butter in the past. So why is the Daboya salt not mined and commercialized? It's still in process. It's been preserved as a relic for future generations. So it has not been commercialized for the fear that this can be lost. It is a gift of God that the river floods and after that, when the river subsides, a lot of sand is left there and there's a lake in there. One does not know, you commercialize it and it vanishes. We have to go look at it also from superstition and look at it also from commercial Point of view. It is interesting how indigenous boast of the non existent salt. The people spoke about benefits they derive from the salt mining area. They sift the sand for medicines. Even though salt is not seen in larger volumes in recent times, they still hold on to this treasure. Experts say salt mining in large volumes can improve the living standards of people within these communities through its revenue. This means commercializing the Daboya salt will help to develop that part of the country. The question still stands, where is the Daboya salt? Where is the salt? The salt is in the boya. How is the situation like? Uh, we are not able to mine it for now. That's the situation. That's the real situation. We are unable to mine the salt, but the salt is in commercial deposits in the boya. Mr. Elias said mining the salt will require huge investments, which is currently unavailable. Everywhere you talk about the boya, the first thing the art is about the salt. That salt is natural salt. It's natural salt, it's also iodide. So, it tells me that it's even, in fact, here locally, our local people see that the Daboya salt as medicinal. Yes, they see it as medicinal. But well, most of the local treatment they added the word salt. He believes that to successfully bring the salt mine to life requires partnership with private organizations who are willing to help revive the dying salt industry at Daboya. The salt that we have in Daboya, the best that this assembly can do is to market it, to keep talking about it to keep putting it on our website so that to draw the attention of the business community that there are prospects here is the best that we can do.
the people of Daboya also say government's flagship program, One District, One Factory, will be the game changer for them. When the idea of One D1F came, that was what we chose. And the ministry earmarked uh, North Gonja for that. In fact, they were, they, we, you know, they, they were, the idea of One D1F is not directly a uh, government funded initiative. Government is supposed to support private business people to develop or to establish a factory. We have written a number of times and nothing happened. The demand that you should have a certain amount of standing capital cannot be that of this industry. And so it's a, a different system does not require capital, but can require acumen, managerial acumen. My next port of call was the Department of Geography and Resource Development at the University of Ghana, Legon. My mission there was simply to find out whether there has been any research on the existence of the Daboya salt mine. I met with Dr. John Kusimi. I'm aware of uh, this salt mining processes in Daboya, uh, in the formerly northern region now within the Savannah region of Ghana. It's something that is known and documented by a lot of uh, scholars uh, over a period of time. One of our professors, Professor Dixon, has a few articles on salt mining in Daboya. The question is, how are salt deposits identified? We have one method called remote sensing, whereby satellite images uh, in space are able to sense energy level of certain minerals in the earth, including salt. So certain bands of the satellite images uh, are able to pick signals of certain minerals, including salt. So experts in remote sensing can do this analysis and will be able to come out with some telltale signs that no, there are signals of salt or this mineral deposits here. All right. Besides that, we have what we call a geomorphological and geological analysis or features. Okay, the nature of the the, the earth surface. The, the, the valleys that we have, the falls that we have, the mountains, the cracks, and the openings, we call fault lines, sometimes uh, uh, give signal of the presence of some of these minerals uh, in the earth. By studying the nature of some of these geomorphological features or landforms, because sometimes most of these minerals get themselves trapped in these structures. So one is able to tell, it gives some clue as to whether this mineral is present or not. Dr. Kusimi mentioned evaporation, rock salt mining, and vacuum evaporation as three types of salt mining processes. The solar process, what happens is that uh, the salt water the highly saline salt water is, is, is pumped uh, into ponds, as most of us have seen along the coast of uh, Ghana, Keta, uh, Pambros area, they are down Songo. That is the, the commonest process that people use in extracting uh, salt from the salt solution, which is called a brine. So, uh, this is very prevalent in uh, localities where uh, you have very high energy, solar energy, energy, especially in the dry season. So it hastens evaporation and the salt will precipitate. Now with the extraction one, uh, salt is deposited beneath the earth, like gold and other ores that we know. So, uh, mining companies will have to drill tunnels or shafts to hit the bed and then extract it just like gold is done. Now the third process is called the, the vacuum process. The, that particular process is similar 
to the drilling to the, the, the bed uh, of the soil deposit. But the difference here is that the only wells that are drilled vertically to the salt, then they connect the wells by vertical uh, lateral tunnels. So a well is dug here, a second well there, they connect it multiple wells. Then water is pumped into one well, it dissolves the salt, it drains into the other well, then that is pumped out, processed, and then treated uh, to, uh, by removing any contaminants or impurities and it is used. Unlike salt mining sites like Songo and Pambros, which have salt visibly on the earth's surface, Daboya is different. The case of Daboya is in between the vacuum and then the salt process. If you read literature, literature tells you that the Daboya salt mining process is rock salt. But what happens there is that the salt is mined along the river uh, valley, the river bank, that is the white water. Now here, wells are not dug into the salt deposit and then the water pumped out. It is groundwater that has infiltrated to the salt base that dissolves the salt. So when such localities are exposed and the water oozes out, then the miners will collect the, the, the highly saline solution, uh, uh, sieve it, then take it home, boil it to evaporate the water, and then you get the salt. Dr. Kusimi disagreed, claims by indigents of Taboya that certain rituals must be performed before the salt deposits may surface on the ground. It's a myth. There are a number of myths surrounding the salt extraction processes in uh, Daboya. If you come to alluvial gold mining, uh, there are those myths about it. Uh, sometimes you hear that it is when the pit collapses on the people, then you get more gold and whatnot. This is a scientific process. Okay, so the salt is there. So it is when it is exposed, then the individuals will get it. Now, what happens in Dabuya is that there are certain individuals within the community or town who have the knowledge and expertise in this, okay? So they surround this uh, uh, expertise or their experiences over the years in detecting places or localities where this can be found. Mm -hmm. And there is even a particular clan that is well known for such experience. So that is why uh, you have that, that myth, uh, but that is not uh, the situation. It is not true. Experts call for intensive education and community engagement to erase the numerous myths about the Daboya salt mine before any extraction can commence. As a nation, sometimes when we are able to detect some of these natural resources and we feel that it's a good resource that will enhance and promote the socioeconomic development of a locality. It's very good to find a way of educating the people and bring to bear the scientific explanations to some of these things so that uh, we can further enhance the development and exploitation of the resource to the benefit of the people. Currently, Ghana exports 51,000 tons of salt annually. Statistics from a 2019 report show that about 300,000 metric tons of salt were produced in Ghana. Unfortunately, this was a decrease from 330,000 metric tons in 2018. We're looking at an export of about 51 thousand tons you know um, in, from in Ghana and in terms of money uh, we are looking at around uh, 2.3 million US I mean dollars as an export but basically the concentration has been at the coast I mean for mining so we're looking at Kita, Ada, um, Weja, Komenda and you know around the Zima West area so uh, that is um, the structure of our salt mining. But I can tell you that, apart from the internal markets that we have for salt, there is uh, an outer market as well.
because uh, most of their hinterlands, I mean, those that don't have much coast, um, depend on salt for their feed as well. And so um, it, there's a big market to it. And if we can explore and get better into it, I think it should be able to go a long way to help the nation. It is a known fact that salt deposits in a community have the potential to attract investors both locally and internationally. Experts believe that the Boya salt deposit, if properly harnessed, could create employment opportunities for the indigenes. Our natural resources, as we have it now, are supposed to be used to create the wealth from the earth which would in turn give jobs to indigenous and other people in the area. So much as we're trying to develop our resources by creating the wealth that resources have, have and at the same time creating jobs for indigenous. It depends on uh, who is um, tapping into the salt and then the contract that we go into. Um, usually in Ghana, we don't place much value on our resources, and especially when the processes of mining are quite complex and more financially oriented. Then we try to seek foreign investors to come in, you know, to come and help. And when a foreign investor comes in with their finances, obviously they strike a deal, and um, the deal could be into ratios, whatever comes out. So as to whether it will go a long way to help the community or not, depends on the value that the nation will place on it. If we place good value on it, then obviously uh, it should be a mining that will you know, uh, help the country generate revenue and at the same time, should have an economic spillover to the people that lives in that environment. Some of them could be the employment that is likely to create for them, some of them could be businesses that can develop alongside, you know, the salt mining. If properly mined, commercialized, it is expected to uh, create some employment for the local people. The first question you should ask is, what kind of employment? The people who are living there, do they have the expertise to be employed? Is it, uh, do we want to sort of encourage small scale to medium scale mining? whereby it is, the, it is the local people who will be trained and then assisted so that they will mine directly and then be employed. Or we are going to commercialize it and allow the company to come in. So what kind of human resource personnel are there? Are they going to be drivers? Are they going to be uh, uh, carrying salt and bagging? But you know, in recent times, most companies or industries want to sort of uh, mechanize their processes such that it becomes cheaper. What 100 people or 50 or 20 people can do sometimes just a few machines. And then in the long term, it becomes more economically profitable to the company than paying larger hands. That becomes economic uh, uh, financial burden to the, the company. There are a number of approaches to determine whether salt in an area can be exploited in commercial quantities. If we see it to be a project as a country and we turn it to be in the feasibility stage, we are able to do all the possible risk analysis and then be able to ascertain whether it will be a project that the financier, when he put his money, can pay for itself and then possibly look at the extensions, externalities to the project. So possibly the spillover to the parents who are living in the area, how their kids, their parents getting regular income through job creation of the, of the, of the salt mining, and then this regular income building up into school attendance and all those, lifting you know, the people out of certain poverty level in the, in the, in the area. I think it will, that's how it's supposed to be for most of this project. Before you can es exploit or extract certain minerals on such commercial quantities. You need the presence of certain infrastructure, like good road network, is it a rail network, or even is it a community that needs to be uh, airlifted, all right? Electricity, water, and whatnot. 
So this, the presence or otherwise of such facility need to be analyzed. How much if this is what we need to facilitate this physical infrastructure is what we need to facilitate the extraction of this mineral and it's not there. How much will it cost us? So at the end of the day, will it be cost uh, uh, beneficial to us? Experts call on government to place value and inject more capital in the salt industry since it has the capacity to reduce growing unemployment in areas with vast untapped resources as salt and the country at large. These are things that they cherish, okay? And I don't think when it comes to uh, the emphasis on the, on, the, on the way we cherish our, our, our resources, how we transfer that into the negotiations that we go into in terms of uh, financing. Uh, most of the time, uh, we lose that aspect. I remember, if you read the history of gold, you know, it was like the British were just carrying them away, you know, just like that, because we have it. And most of the time, if you have it, um, because of those uh, traditional, you know, eyes that you have for it, it becomes difficult to place value. And so, um, it, it, this, it feeds into the modern way of negotiations, you know. Uh, but uh, from the way you are speaking, I think it, it's some, something that the mining will not be that difficult and the resources needed to mine will not be that difficult. Then I will encourage the state to take it as wholly own. In terms of investing in the Daboya salt mine, they caution government about over-reliance on foreign investors. This is not like petrol, that it will be offshore, that the technology that you need you will need a foreign technology to come in. But if it's something that it's onshore and the mining is easier, I think for the benefit that goes with salt, I will encourage the state to go in as a wholly owned uh, kind of uh, project. The head of minerals title department at the Minerals Commission, Mr. Hassan L. Hassan says, government is aware of the Daboya salt, but its economic viability has not been done. The Daboya salt, hasn't gotten much needed attention because of the large marine potential we have in the south. But it's not as if it doesn't exist, it's there. What needs to be done is to do some more extensive exploration of the salt in the Daboya area to establish the quantum, the volumes that we have and the quality and further to determine whether it's viable and this is mostly done through exploration where we're able to determine or establish the economic viability of these resources. This, I believe, the government has done its fair share of the uh, work. The Geological Survey and Minerals Commission are also working together to see how best we can develop the salt in the area. But then we're standing, all boils down to funding the exploration and uh, getting money to do uh, such work is what we are thinking of a very innovative way that we can get the money to do the exploration, to establish some degree of economic viability and see how investors would come on board to see us develop that. Some challenges in the sector were highlighted. The quality of salt that is being mined there you know, uh, we know the quality of salt that the coast brings. But then over there, it could be maybe a second grade, third grade type of salt. Then you will not get the necessary revenue as expected if you are doing comparative valuation with our um, coast, the coast salt. So those are the possible challenges. And then also the people living in the enclave. You know, um, these days people are becoming aware of themselves. Or, and the resources they have. Um, everybody is trying to identify what he's offering to the country. And so therefore, if you are tapping into it, you have to make sure that they, they, give, they, they benefit from it. So they, there's a likelihood that you can have that kind of that societal pressure, litigations and all those issues. And then I foresee a situation where land issue, litigation issues will also come in because of our land ownership structure. You know, most of the mining companies, those are the problems they face, and it won't be different. 
Experts say Ghana can mine about 2.2 million tons of salt annually. This figure can be increased if sites like the Daboya Salt Mining Area is developed. There have been proposals towards adopting public-private partnerships (PPPs) as one viable means of stimulating economic growth in the salt industry. Principally, the PPPs will enable the government to provide better infrastructure and services by making for use private sector resources to ease government burden. Conventionally, Daboya is known to be the hub of smoke, a traditional clothing worn by the people of the northern extraction and embraced by other ethnic groups, tourists and popular personalities. Discovery of salt at Daboya could spur the local economy to another level. The myth surrounding this year to be tabbed resource poses the challenge of how to break traditional stereotypes into alignment with dictates of modernity. The switch would mean tapping natural resource wealth to the advantage of the people who live within the irony of having too little in the midst of plenty. Beatrice Sanaju. GVC News, Daboya.